let's uh, let's kick it off. Welcome sure. to Brook Sandwiched In. Um, mm-hmm. This is a program brought to you from the New Haven Free Public Library. So thank you all so much for being here. I'm Isaac Shubb, and I'm here today with my colleague Toby Kasim, and we're very lucky to be welcoming back to our program Professor Lewis Gordon. Uh, thank you for being here, Professor Gordon. Professor Gordon is Department Head of Philosophy at the University of Connecticut. He is the editor with Jane Anna Gordon of the journal Philosophy and Global Affairs, as well as the book series Global Critical Caribbean Thought, along with authoring many books, including Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism, and last year, Freedom, Justice, and Decolonization. He's the editor of the American Philosophical Association blog series, Black Issues in Philosophy. His most recent book, which is the focus of tonight's conversation, is Fear of Black Consciousness, published by Farrar, Strauss, and Guru in the US, and Penguin Random House in the UK and elsewhere um, around the globe. The book is currently on Literary Hub's list of the most anticipated books of 2022. It was just released on Tuesday. So Professor Gordon has been on a rampage of talks and we're lucky to have him here. Um, Thanks again for being here. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here again. And as uh, one um, one, uh, commentator put it, your book's a Capricorn. (laughs) (laughs) It is. It's a Capricorn. And I was pleased to see that New Haven actually has one mention in your book. Uh, when you're walking with your son and he sees a mounted police officer, you're in New Haven. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's when my son was just two years old. And, you know, he, um, the story I bring up is um, he saw a police officer, yeah, a mounted police officer on a horse. And my son thought that was so cool. So he was like, hi, Mr. Policeman. <laughs> And the policeman looked down at him and, you know, waved and he thought that was so great. And I thought, wow, you know, the moment he, he, be, he hits adolescence, maybe even sooner, I have to explain to him how dangerous an encounter <laughs> that would be. Yeah. And, um, but I was also bringing it up because that was a context in which I was writing my first book. And the context was this. I was... I wanted to write about police violence. And there was a section where I want to talk about this. But of course, if you're a scholar, you got to go consult the social scientific literature. But most of the social scientific literature was saying there wasn't any police violence. There was very little. And I was like, what the hell is this? I mean, I grew up in the Bronx. I know I see what they do. Not only that, I see police corruption. I've seen police officers in New York just stop at street corners, put their hands out, and individuals will run out with wads of cash that high and put it in them and they drive off. So, I mean, I'm, there's a whole other story about police officers that are not like these valorized images in movies and what a police benevolent association would not want you to, to know. So I knew the truth. That's the problem. Man. I know the truth, but I was dealing with a conundrum which is the academic world, the demands of social science, ironically, depended on lies. So how was I gonna get the truth? And at that time, I remember when I would look into some journals, they would, the reason why there were very few cases was because you could only get to say the cases were real if the police officer was convicted. Now, Now think about this problem, right? Technically speaking, if that's the criterion, there is very little police violence or assaults in this country. Now we know that's false. I mean, I remember times my mother would come home, she was, she was working in the emergency room in the hospital in the Bronx, and she would just be so disturbed because people would come in just battered near death. And when the nurses or the physicians say, what the hell do you do to this person? Then they'll beat up the police, the uh, medical doctor or the nurse. My mother's view was police officers were just so violent or the number of black women I knew who get stopped for a traffic violation and the police officer points to a motel or a hotel. And tell, you know what I'm saying? To, to, to tell them to go in there. So what was I to do? And then it struck me when I had that reflection on my son. And I talk about this in the book. I decided instead of going to the, the social scientific uh, data that was dependent 
upon convictions, I decided to look up childcare books. I'm a parent. And so I picked up a book by, J, by Comer and Poussant, Black Child Care. And when I opened that book and just went to the index, boom, there it was, right? And the reason it was there, what's different about this was this was a book of parents writing letters to psychiatrists on what to do when things happen to their children. And so I was able to have a different kind of analysis because these parents were, were writing in to these psychiatrists saying my child was beaten or my son was beaten or my daughter was beaten up, this and that, what do I do, how do, and how do I handle this? And in a way I was able to ha uh, have access to a forum in which people were speaking the truth, you see? And this was the beginning of me learning that, um, it's something I talk about in this book as well, that you see, to talk about race and racism, and not just race and racism, but um, the many convergencies of dehumanization premised upon the inequalities of power, the mechanisms of exploitation and degradation, they require us thinking outside of the box. They require us using uh, methods of indirection. They require us learning how people from different walks of life can converge and communicate truth. And so that's in the context of this book where it's bringing up this example, because for the most part, there's an arsenal, an arsenal of uh, bullying and resources from the Police Benevolent Association and the police officers themselves that basically try to bludgeon everyday people into living lies. And to give you an idea of how bad it could be beyond I, what I'm saying already is pretty bad. I remember when I had um, finished my undergraduate studies, there was a, a fellow, he and I did honors uh, in, in multiple areas, but we were also, we did honors in political theory and he was Puerto Rican and you know, I'm from Jamaica and a few years later, before I, just when I was just about to leave to pursue graduate studies, you know, when I was just leaving to go to New Haven, he called me out of the blue. And this young man, was, you know, we were in our 20s, was mortified. He said he just needed somebody to talk to. And I said, well, yo, man, what's up? And he said he thought he could make a difference with you know, what he learned and the fact that he's an educated individual and he joined the police force. And I was like, oh, uh, okay. And he said, the things he witnessed as a police officer with regard to the behavior of other police officers was shocking. But the thing that shocked him the most was their criminal behavior. And the reason he was calling me was because the other police officers gave him an ultimatum. Either he would join them in the criminal activity or he was terrified. And so that gives you an idea of how bad it could be. You know what I mean? And uh, even if he left the police force, he witnessed too much. And this is one of the reasons why it's not that every police division is that way. But what I've witnessed over the years is that these are criminals who manage crime. And as a consequence, they're more a gang. And in other places, there is an extent to which they could function as public safety, smaller degrees of you know, support, et cetera. But what we have is really a, a profound level of menace to public safety uh, because of unchecked, unbridled, activities on the parts of individuals who are ultimately the mechanism through which crime is maintained and managed in many urban areas. And perhaps, I don't know much about the rural ones, but again, to speak their truth requires, well, what, well one thing it's going to have to require is for people to have the mechanisms through which to see better. 
And of course, in the story I just told, that friend of mine, of course, was not a corrupt police officer. He was not, but, but to be a good police officer can be a situation in which your life is jeopardized by your fellow officers. Mm. And so that, is a, that was both, there was, that was twofold. It was when I was just beginning to go off to do graduate study. And then suddenly here I am with my son and having that knowledge. <laughs> and of course you could see how black people function as a scapegoat for this. You know what I mean? Because we know for fact, the truth is everybody knows this. You know, black folks know this, especially when you grow up near white neighborhoods. White people commit so much crime. Oh my God. And, 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 and I'm talking about across the board. White girls, man, the number of them who go into the department stores and sort of walk out just carrying stuff. And young white men who destroy everything from property to violence, you name it. But here's the thing. You know, with all that crime they're committing, why, you know, life goes on. You know, the open secret in this society is that um, a lot of crime isn't that much of a big deal. The true problem, and these are the crimes that are not <laughs> often uh, convicted, are the criminals who are gutting the society of billions, maybe trillions of dollars, and who are being protected by a whole mechanism in which our government resources are designed to enable them through a web of legislation to get away with what they do. Right now there's somebody getting a tan in, in, in sunny Florida who went away with your parents' retirement funds in the end of the 2000s. And there are all kinds of, we're talking about these people in Afghanistan, but we already know who gutted and made a lot of money off of the, the people who least receive the resources that our taxpayer dollars put into Afghanistan, Iraq, and so forth. The people who least received it were the Iraqi and the Afghani people. You know, it's these, these, these privatization of, you know, of resources people who ran off with the money. So we need to have better conversations on everything from crime to the question of its prevention and the question of enforcement in the society and others. It's not in unique to the United States. It's, it's, it's happening in a lot of places. Yeah, um, somewhat related, at least, at least, well, maybe on the, given a little bit about the topic of, of the police, um, Isaac and I were both um, interested in your statement, um, which, which would definitely help elucidate the title that, um, you know, you grew up in Jamaica, but you came to black consciousness in the Bronx. Um, oh, correction, and, I didn't grow up in Jamaica. Oh, you were born I, my, my childhood was up until I was nine. I was in oh, Jamaica. You know, I, I was also I was born in Nigeria and I lived in Nigeria since so I was nine as well. So it's a very it's like a, a very specific what? age. A lot of people I know were around that time. Um, and yeah, I, I think I can definitely say like there's something about having that childhood experience, like and particularly not growing up in a different country, but having the childhood experience in a different country and coming to know race up until a certain point or knowing your your identity or your skin color up until a certain point as not racial. And then coming to America and experiencing that that difference or something changing when you when you get here. So um, I mean, and I think uh even like my family always lived in the suburbs. So we were like it wasn't always that. I was confronted with like a major um, larger scale political project around what I was around my around the, where I lived. But I think um, at, at a certain point when I started when I started noticing the the frequency of police killings on the news, I started to I started to understand something about blackness in this country that's that's not like you know being in being in a West African country and and being and and being black which, which is still the word they use there but just not in the same way so yeah we're, we're, we just wanted to know a little bit more about how that um how your childhood in jamaica kind of inflected both your understanding of what it means to be um just yourself and then maybe what it means to be black and how and how that kind of blossoms into a, an experience of black consciousness in the in the context of america yeah. sure 
Well, the first thing is, uh, I, I go directly to that in the prologue of the book, okay? And one of the things I mentioned there is that when you, if you say Jamaica, most people think of Jamaica as a black country. Santiago, black country. Uh, and then you, you know, if you get into Latin American countries, it gets a little tricky. You say, you know, if you say Dominican Republic, or you know, if you were to to say Colombia, or you know, one of those Mexico, it gets a little trickier. But here's the thing: if you stick with a black country, when you're a child in a black country, what a lot of people don't understand is it's very interesting. It's called a black country. Because as you know, it's multi, in American terms, it's multiracial in US terms, right? So there's already a difference when the national consciousness is a black country, even though it's not saying black consciousness. So one of the things of course, is that you see so many nuances in people. You know, my family consists of people who are in, 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 in more specific parlance, people who are of Ethiopian, Palestinian, Tamil, Chinese, Scottish, Irish, you know, the whole, that they're all there. But what's striking is all those names I just mentioned in this country would be separate racial categories. But what's strange about Jamaica is they're just all black. And what's interesting about it is they don't say the word black. And this is the part that's rather interesting. What they are is a range of of complexions and ethnic backgrounds, but nothing in them foreclosed possibility. In other words, in Jamaica, the people who in the United States are designated black, in Jamaica are people who could be a prime minister, could be a lawyer, a doctor, a professor, could also, we, could also, we don't want to be bourgeois now, they could also be a custodial worker, they could be a farmer, they could be anything, you see what I'm saying? So there wasn't a sense in which it's in our consciousness as children in Jamaica that we lacked possibility. Do you see what I'm getting at? So when, and when a child is raised with possibility, it's just like, if I go back to when my son said, Mr. Policeman, if, his future adult life is not one in which he's profiled and could even be on death row when he is innocent of a crime, then that relationship to that police officer is not of a limitation, but could be a possibility. He could, you see what I'm saying? Well, similarly in Jamaica, they were like the police officers. They were um, judges, the list goes on. So you could imagine, and you probably experienced this when you came here, um, suddenly there's this wall, this thing that's telling you that by virtue of your designation, that you, your possibilities are not the same as somebody who could be less talented than you, somebody who could be, I mean, dumb as spit. The person could have more access than you. And the person doesn't have to be dumb. You could be equally smart, equally good. You know, you could play together as children. You're both human beings. But suddenly, there are more possibilities to a person who's designated white than a person who's designated black. And you could imagine for me how weird it was also because my family in this country's understanding is multiracial. So I never saw anything in my family that I later discovered in this country, just by accident of landing in Jamaica versus landing in Boston or New York. Some of my relatives by landing in Jamaica became black people. But if they had landed in you know, New York or Boston would be white people. But I never had in me the consciousness of them as superior to me or inferior. And that's because of course it's your family, you know how they smell. You know, when they go to that toilet, it stinks like any other toilet. You know what they eat, you know their fears, 
you know when they say something ignorant and you know when they say something smart. So that, um, but the story I tell in the prologue, and I think that's what you're hinting at to Toby, is the first time I was called the N-word. You see, it's not that I was aware of dark skin or light skin. We all know that, just like in Nigeria, there's so many nuances from Ibu to Yoruba to so forth. You know that. But you see, but the N-word placed negation and abjection and inferiority. And I knew the N-word really didn't have to do with my de facto color. There were Black people darker than me and Black people lighter than me. It was about a location that gave someone a sense of entitlement to degrade me. And because I was not raised with a fear of white people, as you know in the chapter, I beat the crap out of them. <laughs> and I said something that unfortunately many people in this country are programmed to dislike. But I say, frankly, it's unhealthy for black people not to have the experience of standing up to white people. Because white people know if the positions were reversed, they would, they would not want to tolerate their degradation. Yet we are constantly being bullied, constantly being deprecated, constantly being moralized at, that we are to be passive recipients of white violence against us. And that's BS. Dignity and freedom require standing up for yourself, even if you lose. And that's the part that people, you see, it's cowardice to say you will only stand up if you will win. And it, you know, and I've had the crap beaten out of me in life. <laughs> but, but, but I walk away with something that even the people who have so-called won the fight have lost. And that is self-respect. I, um, I wanted to ask you about your book charting a whole journey, a philosophical argument, it seemed to me, that you develop about how Black consciousness with a capital B is formed. And in order to do that, you talk about first coming to the Bronx and seeing what it means to be Black in a white supremacist or uh, culture in the United States in a way that you didn't see in Jamaica, if I'm understanding it correctly. And... Um, and, and at that point, once you have started to define what that experience is like, which you just talked about, then you all, or even maybe before you talk about white consciousness and white supremacy and the narcissism that you associate with it and the desire to be a God, or that can be associated with it. Um, and so as we kind of move along in your philosophical argument, can you talk a little bit about that? Cause I found that really interesting. Sure. Well, first of all, for, um, to, to break it down, um, every parent knows this. If you take any child and tell that child that child is superior to other children and raise the child that way, you're going to raise a schmuck. You're going to raise a, a, a person with narcissistic disorder. Yet yeah, that's exactly how most white people are raised. And I, I, I stress in the book, it's not that every white person is that way. But there's a whole world that's constantly bombarding white people with the thesis of superiority. And that is unhealthy for any human being. In fact, there's a very famous adage. It's, an, it's erroneously as, uh, ascribed to her, Ernest Hemingway, but it actually goes back more than a thousand years, which is a good human being doesn't seek to be superior to others. A good human being seeks to be superior to her, his, or their former self. In other words, you try to make yourself a better person each day. Well, what narcissism does is say, you're superior just by birth, just by virtue of just being. It's like, here I am, whatever that identity may be. And in this country, it was white. But the thing is, there's a distinction between white supremacy and anti-Black racism. You could get rid of white supremacy and still have anti-Black racism. Because you could say, yeah, you don't believe white people are superior, but Black people are definitely inferior. And that's in a lot of, you know, Latin America, all over the place, right? But here's the thing. 
At the same time, when we talk about these issues, we must remember we're talking about human beings. And when we're talking about human beings, there are human beings who will believe the BS that's told to them. And this is connected to something deeper. You see, if exploitation, colonialism, uh, and the long list of isms depended on direct material violence to maintain themselves, they would exhaust themselves very quickly. It is much more efficient to get people to believe pleasing falsehoods, for them to be pleased by the falsehoods, and for, not, for them not to believe displeasing truths. And I refer to that as bad faith. Well, the effort to create pleasing falsehoods has been so good that there are even people who are the victims of it who want it to be true, those things that are false. Because you could live with yourself better in some cases if it turns out that white people are superior <laughs> because then it means you deserve the crap that's done to you, you know, such it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, and, and there are white people, as you know, so invested in it that they don't want you to question it whatsoever. We see all of this anti-critical race theory stuff, all, but there's a lot of narcissistic rage going on among, in, um, among many white groups. And some of it is also engineered to be, to be quite frank. It's a technique that's done on the right over and over. But here's the thing. So there's a whole edifice of lies. That's the first thing to remember. Racism is built on a lie. If it were built on a truth, then we would have already lost. At the end, we are, they're just inferior people, superior people, end of story. But the lie of racism then means that there are black people who are an aggregation of lies. If you're black, you're dumb, you're lazy, you're the long list of inferiority, you're prone to crime, blah, blah, blah. And so, and that's the foreclosed view. Now that's lowercase b black. That's the, you know, it started as from Negro to long list of terms all the way to the N word. However, however, one of the best ways to understand what's going on here is through an example of Richard Wright and Jean-Paul Sartre. Sartre asked Richard Wright when Sartre visited New York to take him to Harlem and Sartre asked Richard Wright about the black problem. And Richard Wright said, there is no black problem. There's a white problem. <laughs> and you could see the rest following there. So the problem is making people into problems. However, if you look at human beings as people who face problems, now you can do something. It doesn't matter what race they are, right? It doesn't matter. Whether they're, whether they're looked at under as Asian, you know, black, brown, whatever. Now, when you look at a society having a problem of making people into problems, there are things you can do politically to change that society. And that makes you actional, makes you an agent. So at that moment, if you're a black person, what I point out is the first one locks black people into the negative. It, it treats you as if you get up in the morning and all you're doing is trying not to be black. But what it elides is that there's a whole black world that's also positive, that's full of things you love, your food, your family, their, you know, the music you listen to. If you, if you were to take black people out of the history of this country, oh my God, the inventiveness. And again, this is not to valorize black people above. There are white people who are creative. They're Native Americans. They're, they're long list. But the point is, we're talking about anti-black racism. Anti-black racism says no black person is worth anything. Well, that's just false. We already know this because those of us who become black, so to speak, are from countries where the same people are able to do all kinds of great things. No problem. And there are black people in this country who do quite well. So here's the thing. Capital B Black is different. Capital B Black is to be an agent of history and a Black who realizes truth. Fear of Black consciousness is the fear of the consciousness of that truth. 
And that truth is that we have built a lot of this society on lies. And we would actually be better human beings and we can live better not only with each other in what's called across racial lines, but also better with each other within racial lines. Because let's face it, there are white people who are bullying white people to act like they're superior to other people. There are a lot of white people who don't believe that crap. And then similarly, there are black people who really try to get black people to believe our inferiority. And we have to fight against that crap too. So in the end, the capital B black consciousness is for us now to take the active steps of building a relationship to truth, to reality, and to take on the political responsibility of building a better world. This a really quick thing that I that I like that, that this connects to is when like I mean this this happens in the book and if, you know you can watch a Spike Lee movie and run into a white character who's racist but has to justify the fact that they love Michael Jordan <laughs> or like they love Michael Jackson right and the famous the famous Spike Lee scene is where in the pizzeria where where um, Sal's son says they're not N words, you know, the, like Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan, they're not N words, and it's like we, you, what, 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 a lot of what we're doing is just trying to trying to think about the contradictions that that the society creates when it, when you have to live by this immediate inferiority or immediate um, immediate Thank assumption. You, that you're, that's an announcement. Yeah, so I guess. Yeah, so I guess. Toby's got an announcement going on overhead. This is the reality of being in a library. Yeah. <laughs> As you can oh. see, in, in true kind, I decided to sit down in my library. <laughs> yeah. We keep the library thing going here. Mm -hmm. you, you know, hang out with Frida over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, one of my questions is just how, how the valences of action um, and so many villains of action appear in the in in the fear of black consciousness that we were excited about because there's there's a, there's a lot of really um, illuminating cultural study and cultural reading of movies and 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 music and other books, um, and we can talk about that. And, and I, actually, I'll, I'll I'll put that as one side of the question. But I'm also interested in um, another side of the question, which is like you know how political action gets figured or gets represented. Um, I was reading, I was reading um, James Baldwin's Journey into a Region of My Mind, and I re realized that in the, in the 60s in particular, there was a really strong urge to describe the burgeoning Black consciousness of, of the civil rights movement as almost like directed against the American dream and anti-capitalist. Um, and I, and I, and you know, and a lot of ways that people would explain the Watts riot or explain the Detroit uprising or was like this is this is black people finally saying that you know we're 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 we know that we're locked out of the American dream and so we're going to revolt against private property. Um, and I find I find that like somehow dissatisfying. I feel like that 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 gives political action a kind of a very weird te teleological aim. That I was, I was wondering if you could, if, if if you could like kind of illuminate um, how political action is not just tied to like dismantling American dream or dismantling capital, but there's something like there's something beyond that. And yeah, uh, anything else you you, you you you're thinking about in terms of like contradictions that um, society forces us to 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 create, but also allows us to expose through art would be would be uh, another way to to frame that question. <laughs> well, the first thing to bear in mind is. If I argue that the fear of black consciousness is a fear or a form of rage against truth and against reality, then it's pretty clear that there is, there is more to the question of black consciousness than the question of racialization. Similarly, throughout the book, what I point out is that there's no such thing as a human being that is one thing. Human beings are relationships of possibilities. And what this means then is that to talk about black consciousness is more an orientation to get to talk about it and many other things. And so for instance, you brought up capitalism, but we have to bear in mind that 
as no matter how much people may try to valorize capitalism, and one of the things we see in the United States is that we're valorizing capitalism to the point of jeopardizing our public health. You speak to many physicians, they'll just tell you straight up that a whole lot of people would be alive today and we would have handled this pandemic be much better if we didn't have the privatization of medicine. And, uh, and if we weren't setting up a situation where their insurance companies privatize that are making billions of dollars off of, of, off of resources people need to live that actually cost them mere pittance to make. So th th there's nothing wrong with having a critique. You don't need to be black to have a critique of capitalism is what I'm saying. But the other part to, that we have to bear in mind is that lies require limiting our imagination. And we're in a false dilemma when we look at the world as simply a constant tug of war between capitalism and socialism. Why are we thinking in such narrow economic terrains? And similarly, when we're trying to understand how people are to deal with the options available to them in a society, it's pretty clear that what is often elided is the mechanism of power. We can use power to facilitate the growth of people, or we could hoard power and block other people's capacity to act and thus use it for the limits, to impose limits on people. It's pretty clear that the history of the relationship to black people in the Euro modern world and specifically in the United States, it was in Canada as well, all across the Americas, all the way through to Argentina. And a lot of what happened in Australia and many other places has been systematic disempowering of people who are designated of a darker hue. And so if we understand what disempowerment is, Disempowerment, because there, history is just replete with examples of what Black people could do if, when we're not being blocked or attacked by institutions of disempowerment. It was Black people who made the difference in the Civil War. Why? The, you know, the South could have won. If it weren't for 250,000 Black soldiers coming in, yo, <laughs> it would have been really, it would be a very, very different situation. But not just there. There's so many examples. It was remarkable, if we use the US context, of what those former enslaved people were able to achieve even within 10 years of emancipation. And it's not that they were sitting around scratching their heads and things fall, fell apart. There were some years, there were 114 instances of whites, mobs, with the aid of the police, and in some cases, the local military was to protect them, going in and burning those communities to the ground. If you have to trip a person so you can cross the finishing line, if you have to shoot them in the leg, if you got to do all that, uh, there's something wrong with you, not those people. So, one of the things we have to bear in mind is how we talk about the logic of exceptions and rules. We have a lie that says a black person achieving is an exception and a white person failing is an exception. A white person failing, fail, I'm sorry, a black person succeeding as the exception means that a black person failing is the rule. Now, a lot of white people fail, but that's just ignored. And so, all we keep seeing are white successes. We don't see all the failures. And similarly, with a lot of black people who manage to thrive, we don't focus on that. There is a fetishizing of black pathology. So one of the things we have to do is to begin the mechanisms of seeking truth. But seeking truth is not as simple as looking up in a book or as you can see in the example of my son in the beginning, seeking truth requires engaging and communicating with others and having the humility always to admit we can be wrong. That's a really, um, I mean, 
you've covered so many themes that you talk about in your book. I wonder if this is an appropriate place to bring up these two age old fallacies about political action directed towards social change that you mentioned. And one is that there's someone out there who's got it right. We just have to find them, just emulate them, and then we'll be doing everything exactly the right way. Um, and the other is that there is truth, certainty, some kind of legitimacy to be found in crowds. So can you expand on, the, on, on those fallacies? Sure. I mean, the, the first fallacy is based on the idea that it's a shoe size that can fit all. Sure, it may work for that person, but it may not work for you. Because this is what happens when we fail to see that people are not things, people are relationships. So for instance, some of you in the audience or you right now in front of me on the screen, um, there are times you have tried, you decide you're going to try something, right? And when you're trying, when you, do, when you do, there's always somebody who says, Isaac or Toby, what are you doing? We tried it already. You hear it all the time. We already tried it. It doesn't work. It's presupposing the conditions under which you're trying it are identical to when they did. That's not necessarily so. So you'll always find somebody who gives it a go and it works. And they're like, how the hell did it work? It never worked before. Well, maybe it's because your efforts before you read improperly. You see, what you read as your failure could have been you actually sending the conditions for my success. There are people, if people believe people never stand up against the system, then a lot of people live with the impossibility that the system can be changed. Yeah. But those people who stood up against the system before and they got the crap beat out and out of them or whatever it may be, but they stood up, the system had to realign itself and more and more generations begin to see possibility. So that's the first thing, right? It's this idea that there's, there's somebody out there, that's the kind of fetishizing God thing. You know, it's very messianic and, you know, there are people, there are people failing to understand that they're not that person. They are who they are in their lived context. And we have to do what we, that really is appropriate for us. The problem with the crowds mentality is that when you just see a big enough crowd, it's really a devalorization of force. And the fact of the matter is that might doesn't necessarily make it right. You can, we could see, look, Trump got big crowds, <laughs> right? I mean, the fact of the matter is, look, um, there's a difference, there's a difference ultimately between a social crowd, which is based on communication. A social crowd is one in which people can actually look at evidence and question what they're doing. That's social, that's different. That ultimately can be the entire planet. But then there's simply a collective that is designed for us not to pay attention to evidence, not to pay attention to the world around us. It is a crowd, it is a crowd true, but it's not actually connected to reality. It's actually a kind of swarm to protect itself under the guise of overwhelming opponents. And for political life, you need to have communication, speech, creativity, and you need to have the kind of power that is premised upon the ability to bring something new into the world, something special. And we know this mainly because ultimately there are many who preceded us who through violence have led to a kind of stalling of humanity. And then there are those who have created conditions in which when we look at their actions, we look back and we say, thank you. That, and they had no reason to know us. Some of them we don't even know, they're anonymous. But political action proper is always for something greater than yourself and something that is ultimately able to enable others to live with dignity and freedom. Oh, you're muted, Toby. 
Thank you for the answer. And also thanks for, uh, for bridging the two somewhat disparate parts of my other answer. <laughs> that was helpful. Or my other question, that was helpful. Um, I really, I, I think um, one thing that's really struck me and, and just continually resonates with me from both um, freedom just in due to decolonization and fear of black consciousness is the way you um, present and really um, kind of reorient our thinking around collective action and around relation. Um, the relationality of it really, you know, it, it it always puts me in a place where I'm like, how have I not thought of it that way before? You know, uh, and I um, one one sentence that that strikes me that 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 resonates with me from this from this book is when you in the chapter that kind of deals with the the spectrum from rights to entitlements to privilege to 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 license. Um, you you say it's a privilege to be able to help others or to be in a position to help others, it actually might be a right. And I, I found that sentence um, really compelling. And I, and I think um, it, it forced, it kind of reminded me to think about, to, to think about how we frame the word privilege, which you do very clearly in this book and how we frame the word privilege, like something that, something that somebody believes that everybody should not have, right? And then, the way that the way that broadcasting happens, the, the the more and more people start to believe that they should not have, even if they even if they have it and they and and, and they're able to share it and they're able to, to make it available to others. So um, yeah, I think it, the question the question I might be asking is um, how do we? This is this is a very, very personal question. Like how do we reorient our thinking and our actions um, or, around not just what we're able to to gain for ourselves or what we or what we think we deserve or what we think we should have but rather um reframing our attention toward what what we're how what we're doing could be something that helps somebody else well before i answer your question i see that susan harvey i mean garvey wrote a question there and i'll read out her question for her and then i'll come to come to yours please, Toby. Please do. Sure, she wrote, is this assault on critical race theory an attempt to annihilate the development, maintenance, and societal acceptance of a healthy Black consciousness? Susan Garvey, the answer is yes. <laughs> it's a form of narcissistic rage because the truth of the matter is, well, first of all, the structure of the attack is based, it's identical to what's called the loaded question. The loaded question is, you ever... It, it, the classic example is if somebody walks up and say, have you stopped beating your wife? I mean, how do you answer that? I mean, you, you have to say either I've never beaten my wife or I don't have a wife. <laughs> what are you talking about? But, so, but the loaded question puts you in a position to have to be defensive. You see, it's a technique. And so you could make anything seem as if it's a slur or wrong if you put it in the form of a loaded question. For instance, if somebody walked up and said, could you believe they're teaching the children mathematics? Now, there was a time when there were people who had that attitude. You see what I'm getting at? You could turn, we already know what evolution and science and all of that. One of the techniques that's done by the right in this country right now is to take anything that would cultivate intelligence in the population and turn it into a slur. Science was turned into a slur. We could talk about things such as, for instance, if you go on the list of what many people want, public health care turned into a slur. Uh, you know, it's to make people defensive. Now, the fact of the matter is, look, little black children encounter racism all the time and live perfectly fine. It's very important for children to be able to address these. The fact of the matter is, uh, white children, um, if they can learn the truth about this country, then we could have adult citizens who are changing it. And the fact of the matter is, this notion about feeling bad, the fact of the matter is, look, when I grew up in New York City, we were watching Holocaust films in schools. Uh, it was horrible, not horrible to me. It was horrible to see that done to other human beings. I think it made us better human beings to know about Shoah, about the Holocaust. I think it would make us better human beings to know about Native Amer the, the genocidal activities against Native Americans. I think it will make us better people to know things 
ranging not only from the Tulsa Homer, Oklahoma riots, but all the way through to the to the many lynchings. The fact that there was a period in this country where the Ku Klux Klan was in the millions. Those are things that are true. But the other part that they're missing in the story, and of course, this is their own shame and embarrassment, because you know a lot of these people are fighting against critical race theory in their schools. I mean, for their children, they're, they're, first of all, it's not being taught in the school. But again, that's the setup, right? For you to to say, no, 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 it's not being taught in the schools. That implies something's wrong with it. When the response is, well, maybe it should be taught in the schools. Well, the fact of the matter is what's freaking these people out is they're my age or a little older or a little younger. And so their kids have to look at them and say, well, what were you doing when people were screwing over all these people? Now they have their own shame to deal with. But the fact of the matter is if they could deal with truth, they could teach their children something better. If they could say to their children, look, I grew up in times where we were actually on the wrong side of history. And I want you, my child, and subsequent generations to be on the right side of history. And that begins with knowing the truth. If they could do that, you know what they'll be teaching their children? They'll be teaching their children that people can change. If we just dig into our foxholes and never address the issue, the worst lesson being taught to children is that people cannot change. So we need critical race theory, okay? The second thing, now, um, if, we, if we come back, uh, I just wanna make sure I answer it correctly, right? The point you were making, Toby, because, uh, you know, so just because I, I went off there, would you come back to it again? Um, the point about relationality? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, I think, um, yeah, it was basically, if, 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 if the idea that, if the possibility of helping other people is a privilege, it also might be a right. Um, yeah, I got it now. Yeah, I just yeah. want to make sure, because I sometimes, you know, I'm talking, I'm on it, and I just want to make sure that I'm accurate here. Yeah. For, the, for the listeners, they may be shocked to find out in this book that I'm a critic of the white privilege discourse. This is a discourse that emerged during neoliberalism. And what bothers me about it is the things that are being called privileges are things everybody should have. Everybody should have the right to clean water, good schools, a safe environment, fair treatment by the police, you know, a fair criminal justice system. The list is long, education, et cetera. It's, there's something wrong in making people feel guilty for having that. What is the issue is not that white people have it, is that there are a lot of white people blocking other people from having it. That's the problem. And the, the people who have the most love that because it has a lot of white people want to hold on to something to keep others from getting it, which keeps these elites in power. The fact is what white people should be doing and L people should be doing is fighting for everyone to have access to clean water, good schools, fair treatment in a criminal justice system. The list is long. But you know, a lot of those things are what's called a healthier society. A lot of those things are the so-called social programs and initiatives and justice issues that right now there are people fighting against. But I do point out that there's a distinction between a privilege and a license. And here's the thing, this sentence makes no sense. I have the privilege of harming you. I have the privilege of stealing from you. It just doesn't work. However, you can in a society create a license that would make people get away with committing harm. Right, the, 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 the popular culture version of it is James Bond, the license to kill. But there are many other examples. In effect, what whiteness had given many white people is to make whiteness function as a license to do whatever they wanted to non-white people without accountability. That's a license, not a privilege. Now, here's the thing. If you're an ethical person and you're given an immoral license, right? If you're just given a license at birth to do whatever you want to a certain group of people, you could object and say, nobody should have that license. Now at that point, you can be in a coalition with the people who lack the license 
to join forces to make sure no one has that license. One can, more, one can fight more politically effectively against license, but the privilege discourse, can we really, really, really tell people they should give up things that are good? I've seen, and the privilege discourse, here's how bad it gets. I've been in African countries where there are young people who have come from, say, because you know there's a stereotype of Africa to make everybody poor. They're, they're really affluent people in Africa, but there are poor people in Africa, just like you can find really poor people in, the United, in, in North America. Now, there are people who struggle to get to university, struggle. And I suddenly see them in public displays of shame about their privilege of being a college student. That is outrageous. That is absolutely outrageous. And it's connected to a moralistic discourse that fails to understand the distinction between politics and ethics and morality. You see, racism is a political matter with moral consequences. You can fight to change a political condition. I usually put it this way. I don't really care that there are certain people in the world who are immoral. I care that they have a lot of power. If you get them off of me, then I'm cool. Now, there, if, if, however, my main goal is to save their soul and to make them moral, then when you have disempowered them, when you've taken them off of me, the fact that they still hate me would mean now I have to do what? Obsess myself with change, changing their brains, their mind, et cetera, which is absurd. That's a waste of energy. There will be people in the world who hate us, but there's a world of difference between people who hate us and they have power versus people who hate us and they lack the power to act on their hate. And right now, the political matter is to put more political power in the hands of those people who are guided by love than those who are guided by hate. Well, I think uh, as we are kind of drawing towards eight o'clock, the library actually has to close, despite the fact I think you could probably go on for another few hours, even though you've been doing this since, you know, three, four a.m. this morning. Um, where did you say you had been earlier in the day, just so everybody knows? I, oh, I started my day in Paris, and then I, I moseyed on over to, um, to Baltimore, uh, uh, and then I hopped over to London, and uh, hopped back to Baltimore, and now I'm hanging out in New Haven. Boy, <laughs> the powers of virtual technology. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe next year, maybe next year we'll be graced by your your physical presence here in the building. Oh, um, that would be wonderful. I I do plan to come down to, to also just to see my wonderful people in uh, New Haven, and I have to give a shout out because I miss him already. You know, you know, Art Art Perlo. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to light a candle for him. It was a, what a beautiful human being. He gave his life. He de dedicated his entire life to the empowering of, of as particularly those who are the disadvantaged. I mean, what an extraordinary human being. Um, if, and, and, and without fanfare, he was a profound man of humility. Uh, he was a man who, with his wonderful mustache, would enter the room, look you in the eye, and you knew that you were valued as a human being. That's what we have lost. But as we know, losing art doesn't mean we have to lose his legacy. On that note, um, you can pick up Fear of Black Consciousness fresh out um, from Farrar, Strauss, and Guru at your local bookstore. Uh, we have many great local bookstores in the New Haven area. And um, I just want to cite a few of the talks you have coming up um, because you have talks coming up if people are interested um, at the Harvard Bookstore on January 14th uh, at 7 p.m. And we're gonna put these in the chat also on January 17th um, at 2 p.m. Um, and these are all, I believe, available online. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are in the chat now. And we also have a few uh, book sandwiched in programs coming up. Uh, just Dr. Jessica Zucker is going to be talking about her book, I Had a Miscarriage, on Thursday, January 27th. And also we'll have a conversation with the reporter and royal Charles Spencer on his 
historical novel White Ship on the 31st at 5 p.m. if that, uh, you know, piques your interest. So um, with that, I think uh, we'll say good night. I just want to thank you so much again for doing this. And uh, it's been great to have you here. Thank you, Isaac and Toby. And to, for those of you who have logged in, and I think this is also on YouTube or something like that. Facebook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's on Facebook. Okay. So for those of you who have logged in, I'll continue being safe, healthy. Uh, I wish you love. And despite the difficult times, I also wish you joy for you to remember your humanity. Thank you so much. There's a quick survey at the end of uh, this program. If you fill it out, it could be helpful to us. We really appreciate it. And uh, so long, we'll see you soon. Thank you, Professor Gordon, as always, <laughs> for the illumination. Thank you.